I'm Andrew, and I'm going to uh, introduce a little bit about what is Money 2020, um, and then we'll, we'll get right into the conversation. We're really uh, fortunate to have uh, Kiki uh, with us today. Even though MasterCard is nearby and purchased, she's actually based in Florida, so a real treat to have her come up and, and join us in New York and be a part of the session today. So some of you may have, uh, I think I may be seeing a couple of familiar faces that were at, with us at the the networking reception last night that Money 2020 sponsored. So, so I run the agenda for the largest financial technology conference globally um, called Money 2020. So it's the end of October, Las Vegas, 11 or 12,000 attendees every year. And then we have other events globally. And uh, a big, so we're talking about the future of money, the future of payments, the future of banking, but also the future of retail and commerce becomes a big part of that conversation. Um, so this is a great uh, sort of, uh, the role that Kiki has at MasterCard is sort of where Money 2020 and I guess the Retail Innovation Conference meet. Um, and uh, so I would uh, encourage all of you to, to take a look at, at, at our event. We have discounted registration for retailers. Love to answer questions about it. And this would be a good sample of the kind of content that we cover at, at Money 2020. So, but the topic today is transforming how people pay commerce for every device. So, Kiki, maybe we, we start by, you know, what does that mean, commerce sure. for every device, <laughs> and the role that you play in MasterCard, and, and sure. uh, yeah. Um, so, I'm part of the digital payments team at MasterCard. Um, the role that I have is really looking, forward looking, looking at what are some of the emerging trends and some of the technology that will actually impact the way in which consumers are shopping today. Um, my focus is in really, as the title says, is in enabling commerce across every device. We have a big initiative at MasterCard making sure that we help facilitate um, and embed payments across any environment that the retailers are looking to, uh, to play. So whether that is within in-app, online, in-store, but then also future technologies like AR, VR, looking at the smart home, connected vehicle, wearable devices, et cetera. So I look at those key categories that are more forward-looking so consumers can actually pay with whatever device is actually more convenient for them. Excellent, excellent. So, so let, let's, we're gonna take a few minutes just to sort of set the stage and then we have some examples that we'll share, some sort of case study examples to go through them. So when you think about that, that customer journey in retail, what, what are some of the more significant changes that you're observing playing sure. and maybe as a part of that sort of the, the role that the payment plays in that experience. Okay. Yeah. So the, the commerce journey in the era of the connected consumer is definitely being reinvented. I think before consumers used to walk into a store, browse the aisles, select the product, basically add to their little card, and then walk and check out um, at the front of the store. There's a number of different, um, the point of discovery is actually changing. Consumers are more and more using technology as a way to identify and find products that are more interesting to them. We know that in a MasterCard study, 85% of consumers today are actually using mobile devices for browsing, but they're not necessarily completing the transaction using their mobile device. So it's really about how consumers are moving between the devices that is most relevant. In the era of this consumer, what is most important is how do we actually deliver an experience that is unified, that can potentially go from online into offline or then back again, so that the consumers can seamlessly move or effortlessly, or effortlessly move between the digital and the physical space. There's a number of implications that this is actually costing, uh, costing on, the, on the retailer side as well as on the issuer side. I would, I would kind of like summarize them in four. Mm -hmm. um, the point of interaction is actually being reinvented. There's new business models that are emer emerging from technologies, from consumers actually using technologies. You know, you move from being able to pay at the in-store to now be facilitating a self-checkout, order ahead, um, uh, uh, find in-store or pick up in-store, and also now cashierless experiences like the Amazon Go type of experience. So the point of interaction being reinvented is definitely something that we're continuing to see and we will continue to see for the years to come. The second one is the way in which payments are actually conducted. 
So the proliferation of devices is actually allowing the consumers to have a, to have a choice at which uh, whatever payment method they're interested in using. That means that I don't, I no longer, I'm, I'm, I'm no longer bound to my physical card. I can actually use my mobile device. I can use a wearable. I can use my Fitbit, my Garmin. I can actually pay within the confines of my car or even in my home using an AR, VR, or even a smart speaker. So the, the definition of devices becomes more prominent and more relevant um, as we move into this new era. I think kind of like speaking about smart speakers, we are also seeing new interfaces, voice agents, te text-based chatbots that, are, that will continue to play and are playing a pretty critical role in where we see this technology evolving. Um, so that's another one. And then finally, what we're seeing is the power of data, or data just being used in, in smarter ways across the retail and physical locations through the use of IoT sensors. Wow, so, so there's a lot of things there. I'm, and of course, with data, you've got this interesting conversation now between customers wanting personalized experiences yeah. and data enabling that, but then privacy and security being a concern, and how do you, how do you balance? What, what if you, I know that we have a, we can talk a little bit more about securing the payment, but just in terms of using data right. in those experiences, what, what have you learned about that? So one of, the, one of the key trends that we're seeing is it's a wave of online retailers that are actually moving into the physical space. The physical space still matters. The brick and mortar space still accounts for 89% of the total US spend. So retailers moving from online to offline, it's not, it's, it's not something that, that, that mm. anybody should question. Does this make yeah. sense? I mean, they do see value in moving into the physical locations. Yeah. Where, there, where there is a disconnect is really in the data that an online retailer that is used to seeing and tracing the consumer whereabouts in the online right. space, they no longer have that offline. So it becomes a little bit harder to differentiate and, and figure out in what way can they play. That's where IoT and IoT sensors is an example, or beacons and um, RFID tags, or there's a number of different technologies that can actually help close the gap. So at MasterCard, we're teaming, we're teaming up, for example, with Ava Retail. Ava Retail can provide um, in-store analytics so that that combined with purchase information that MasterCard has, now we have a full 360 view of that consumer. It's really about what are the consumer whereabouts within the store, how long or how much time are they spending in front of a, of mm -hmm. a specific aisle or a specific product stack. Um, and using that data to help better inform, is my store layout appropriate? Do I need to update it? How do I actually move to, you know, to, uh, using that right. data for product placement? Um, even, even having that information in the fitting room environment makes sense because that is the point in which consumers are oftentimes making the decision to actually buy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then one well, of the other points you talked about is choosing the way that you pay. Mm -hmm. So. We've, we've experienced the rollout of mobile payments with things like Apple Pay, and some of, some of these programs have been very successful and well adopted. We were having lunch and talking about Starbucks and how that was developed. So what have you learned about sort of consumer adoption of all these new ways to pay and what makes them successful and what, what are the challenges and so forth? So in a lot of different ways, it's really about what device do I actually have in the moment? What device is more convenient for this, for any given right. consumer? As a woman, as an example, I find the use of a wearable device much more convenient than my mobile because I right. often carry a big purse <laughs> and I don't want to dig into my purse to actually pay you know, for the subway or right. to actually use um, at a McDonald's or to use in my everyday life. So it is very much one of the things that we have found as we've deployed the Fitbits and Garmin's and is that yeah. consumer behavior sometimes vary based on the device that you're actually using. Um, which is a very interesting, it's a very interesting finding. And when you, it, it applies across a number of other devices when you think about the fact that a lot of different consumers, when you go to your home, you more often than not, you're not, no, you're no longer carrying your mobile device in your pocket. You oftentimes just plug it in, you forget about it, and you, you, you don't even think about your mobile until it rings or beeps, and then you have to go and pick it up. That's where the smart speakers can actually right. come in. Because now, so there is a place for different devices in different environments that will actually matter to the consumers. It's why the connected vehicle and why we're working, for example, with GM to deliver an in-vehicle payment experience or commerce experience within the vehicle. 
because more often than not, it's in the vehicle that you're actually ordering for delivery or you're ordering because I'm running late to my home. So you're ordering in that moment is when you're actually ordering for um, you're ordering food or you have to pay for parking or you actually already use the vehicle to pay for tolling. So there's a number of different use cases that will matter mo more for specific devices. So, so yeah, so it's matching the one of the problems we solve in the experience and then matching the, the payment device to right. that, that experience. So um, a, lot, a lot of times we, we forget, we think about you know, a payment card as this necessary thing and really it's just, it's the, it's the, the proxy. It's the proxy, right? It's, the, it's that digital account number that really is, the, and the, then sometimes the tokenization of that number to keep it secure. So uh, we talked about this a little bit, but uh, to keep us on, on our, our, our script. <laughs> so uh, the, the, how have retailers responded to some of the changes? As you, you're engaging with retailers, MasterCard's trying to take an active role in helping them solve the problems in there. What have you learned about sort of how retailers are responding to this change and the interaction that you've, you've had? Hey, one thing that we know is that there's about 70% of, of US retailers today are investing in digital. They do realize the opportunities right. to, to actually um, enhance the overall consumer experience. And for me, it's really about how do, how do the retailers are then applying it and differentiating their brand and building a better consumer relationship using, this, the, the, using the digital yeah. technology that, that they have available to them. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if we can show maybe one of the... Yeah, one of so, the, um, so let's, yeah, let's move into some of the examples here. So the, the first one we have, and I can jump around if you like, is Marie Claire and, sure. and Neiman Marcus? So at MasterCard, one of the key things that we do is that we, <clears throat> we take, a, we take a, no, a number of different approaches to the work that we do with retailers. So we work with, um, for example, we build products and services that retailers can use to embed payments across any device. We basically do, um, in my team, we drive innovation with building prototypes directly in partnership with retailers so that we better understand this, this changes in consumer behavior. This right here is an example of work that we did with Neiman Marcus for, <clears throat> for what is a digital mirror experience in New York City. So this was actually a, pro um, um, a project that we did this past um, holiday season where the idea being or the hypothesis that we can actually help influence and drive incremental sales Directly, when, directly at the point where the consumer is actually trying on their, their, their pieces. We're using RFID tags, so basically little um, tags that can be embedded directly into, um, into uh, the clothes, the ticket basically. And then once the consumer walks into the fitting room, the, the mirror will actually recognize the pieces that the consumer has brought in. The mirror serves as a virtual assistant, as a personal assistant to that consumer. The mirror, within the mirror, I can actually change the colors, the sizes. Um, I can actually change the language, which was actually, we found it was one of the key features here in New York that was more rele most relevant. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, so the consumer being able to change the language and actually order some of the products in the sizes that they actually, that they actually need, calling on the, the, the assistant outside to actually bring them additional clothing, but most importantly also, completing the sale directly at this point. So they don't have time to actually go back and drop off some of the merchandise. The mirror itself is NFC enabled. So I would be able to, when I'm ready to check out, I can add the, uh, I can add the pieces to a card. And when I'm ready to check out, I simply just tap the mirror using my wearable, using my phone, whatever I need. So you have an ability to drive the entire experience where it's most relevant. Right. We know that 78% of consumers today go to a physical location simply to try on the product. So that is a very critical component. It was a critical component for us to test within this environment, how, can, how do we get the consumer to actually, um, to actually drive better, better incremental sales? And the, the other aspect was the mirror itself also provides you recommendations on pieces that match what you're actually trying on. So if I have, for example, if I brought two pieces, it can actually upsell, it can give me an option to buy a scarf, a necklace, whatever it may be. So you're also adding to the card, unknowingly or knowingly, as you're actually shopping. It's a little mirror, mirror on the wall. It's a personalized wall. experience, yes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> very Disney. But it's, and that speaks to the, the point of purchase changing, right? And, right. and have, have you seen, it was, we didn't talk about this prior, but did you see any 
data on conversion uh, that, that would support that that was working? Or? We saw a, a much higher average ticket on these. Average uh, ticket was and higher. A higher average ticket on these, on these transactions. Okay. So not relative to people that did not. Um, so we did a control, a control set. So people that actually tried on right. in, a, in, a, in a fitting room that did not have a mirror, and then people that actually ended up using the mirror. And we did see a lift, um, not just in transactions, but also in average ticket. Excellent. Should we go to the next one? Sure. OK. So this is Fred, Fred Siegel. So we announced this partnership with Fred Siegel just two weeks ago. Um, it's a partnership in, um, in Los Angeles. Fred Siegel, um, for those of you that don't know, it's a, it's a pretty, it's a custom brand. I mean, so they, they pride themselves in offering custom merchandise, whether that is custom clothing or it, they sell everything from photographs to custom clothing to even a 50-foot tour bus. Um, that you can actually buy, <laughs> buy in there from their catalog or from their store. Um, what we aim to do with Fred Siegel was to really try to bring a digital experience that would be available to the consumer 24-7. It, it is an interactive digital storefront um, that is available in front of the, of the Fred Siegel store. So consumers that are going or are, are actually, um, are actually uh, uh, passing by can interact after closing hours, as an example. Can merely just interact directly with the window, uh, with the window, um, with the digital window. They can actually browse all the products that they have, and they also have an ability to add to cart and pay. Um, one of the things that we wanted to really solve for was the question around privacy and how do you actually facilitate privacy in an environment where it's pretty much open. You have a big window yeah. that everybody passing by can actually, totally the shared. last thing that we wanted There's was for anybody. Yeah. Right, yeah. We, do, we didn't want anybody, for example, seeing somebody typing, as an example, their address or their <laughs> payment credentials. So the way that we actually solved for it was as soon as the consumer was ready to add it to card, the product to card, and was ready to pay, there was a text message that would actually be sent directly into the consumer's phone. It would actually pull up a payment sheet, so you would have the ability to add all of your 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 um, your personal information. I would add my payment, my uh, my shipping information, and then you could simply walk out because the products would actually be shipped to my to my house. Mm -hmm. So it was an experience that was fully immersive, fully or fully digital, um, kind of like in line with the overall custom experience that they were looking that they were looking for. Excellent. I mean, it's and I guess you would expect Mastercard to be involved in uh, facilitating the payment piece, but it's interesting to hear the role that you're playing in the overall customer yeah. experience. And I think the the role of data here is also interesting. In this case, as an example, Fred Siegel was actually looking to test the overall location as well, the ability for you to actually have a digital storefront where you also track the foot traffic that is going by. And you can track the consumer uptake um, and demand for the type of products that they that they have is a much um, less costly <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, uh, experience. Or, or, or as a as a as a retailer, the ability for you to test the location with a pop up shop without necessarily right. having to um, to be fully committed to any given location. With both the mirror and the window, it reminds me of thinking about VR and AR. Mm -hmm. So I've been hearing a, a, everyone was very excited about virtual reality. We did a session at Money 2020 about it. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I'm hearing that now the conversation has shifted to more augmented reality, being maybe more valuable and, and more important. Have you, have you seen that? And maybe comment yeah. about VR and AR experiences. I think the, the, value in, um, the value in this new technology, and perhaps it's associated with, an, with another trend that we're seeing for consumers, is this need to actually build a connection with a product or build a connection with a brand. Mm -hmm. Consumers want to be part of, and they want to understand, the overall process um, that the merchants are going through. An example of that is that's the Domino's Pizza Tracker. You know, consumer actually getting an insight, knowing exactly where in the, where in the process is my pizza ad, so I know exactly when it will be delivered to my home. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's a very successful app. But the idea that consumers also want to be associated with brands that they believe in, that they actually have some shared values with. So this idea of a connection is one that we're seeing more and more within the AR and VR space. Um, AR and VR allows you to, to build a truly immersive experience. Um, it allows you to go beyond, I think, than just, than just merely presenting a product. We worked in MasterCard um, late last year with um, Swarovski. 
So Swarovski, for those of you that, for those of you that know, it's a, it's a crystal high-end um, uh, retailer. They sell everything from jewelry to actually selling um, big chandeliers and, and just very high-end products for somebody's home. We work with their atelier, um, Swarovski, to build a fully VR immersive shopping experience. Um, so consumers would actually put on the headsets, they would be able to navigate somebody's home and actually look at the products and how they would look. But they would also be able to get into the process, they would be able to meet the designers that were in charge of a chandelier and truly and through videos also understand how that chandelier came to be. Um, which we actually found a lot of users very mm. much interested in that aspect of the, of the experience. Um, so I think in the case of AR, VR, part of the challenge is really in, in this idea that I, and why, VR, why AR is actually a lot more, has actually taken off a lot more, is the idea that consumers already have those devices. I mean, so you're already breaking right. a, a key barrier for right. adoption. I mean, consumers already have those devices, therefore I don't necessarily need to, uh, you know, I don't necessarily need to buy a VR right. headset to, right. in order to actually take, um, you know, benefit from it. But where we're seeing AR, really take off in the case of Swarovski as an example was a way for them to become their own voice, become their own reseller um, because they actually rely a lot on um, other third party uh, merchants to sell their product. In this case, they become their, they become their own voice um, and they were able to present additional SKUs that they were not able to show, for example, at a Saks or at an even market that today carries a uh, Swarovski product. The other aspect where we've seen, a, where we've seen AR really take off is in the furniture category. And it really came out because they were looking to solve for returns. The last thing that I want is to have a sofa be delivered to my home and then have to be have to return it. Right. So the idea that I can through um, an AR shopping experience, I now know exactly how does a sofa look like in my living room, um, is also helping solve for a true merchant pain point in their case the data returns. Right. So the 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 next topic here is is chatbots, which combines. AI and the mm -hmm. voice interface. We had a, a track at Money 2020 last year on AI and with Steve Wozniak and all these amazing speakers and it was SRO. It was, it's, so, so let's let's go to that one. So this is this is with uh, Subway. Sure. Yeah. So I think we would be amiss <clears throat> if we didn't talk about the importance of voice agents and text-based chatbots. I put them all in the same category of conversational commerce. But the, the technology that is actually facilitating this is exactly, it's, it's the same. It's called natural language processing. It's the idea that I actually ask a question and then the computer generates a response to me. So it's a two-way understanding. Um, so natural, sure that, I'll, I'll wait for the video. Sure. Let me know when you're ready and we'll, we'll cue that. Sure. Okay. So I think with um, what we've actually seen in the US, is that there's, there's real adoption actually happening of the smart speakers devices as an example. Yeah. We're seeing voice agents actually being widely used by consumers at a much faster rate than I, than, and I, I dare say, than the adoption that we saw for smartphones. So voice as an, as an interface agent is truly going to be revolutionizing again what, what we know today. You know, we went from computers to mobile devices using touch screens now to voice. And we need to make sure that people understand that this is a trend that seems to be quite favorable and moving quite rapidly. So, um, so it's one that we're following very closely. And MasterCard, we conducted a survey just this past uh, the, end of the, the end of the year, and we published a, a, a study um, in January. We found that two out of three consumers today are actually using voice agents already. Voice agents can start by using simple tasks. So I basically, I go into my Google app, I can click on the microphone and I can either search for products, I can use Alexa. The number one application for Alexa, by the way, is to ask for, um, to set the timer. So it's a simple task, but it's, 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 a, it's what I would say, it's a very single task that is, it's basically changing consumer behavior. Because there's a very small step from doing that to obviously driving shopping. What we, um, we also asked uh, about shopping specifically. And what the, uh, what the users, um, it was 3,000 US consumers. And what, the, what we actually found is that 21% of, of US consumers are already, already engaging in shopping. But what was more interesting to me is that out of those users that are actually conducting commerce already via voice agents, six out of 10 are doing it weekly. Six out of 10. That's actually more than what they do in their mobile devices today. So the opportunity 
to actually drive a, a, a truly unique shopping experience using voice seems to be taking off quite rapidly here in the U.S. as an example. So, so one, one uh, last question. I don't know if we'll have, we may have time to take one question or two. Yeah, one or two. We'll have to be okay. quick. But um, with all of these, right, so one of the most important things in, in a payment transaction is the trust and the security of that transaction. And I know you wanted to say, say some words yeah. about, about that piece. Yeah. I think security is critical for MasterCard, right? I mean, I think for us, we need to, we need to make sure that we have a balance between delivering the convenience that merchants want to deliver to their consumers and then ensuring that each transaction is as secure as we can get it to be, right? Mm -hmm. So just as we have actually um, moved into an EMV chip world in the offline space, in the online world, we believe that tokenization will be the way to go. So, and for, for those of you that don't know in our world, when we talk about a token, it's the idea, it's, it's, it's a virtual account. It's basically um, a number, when, I, when you pull out your credit card, that credit card number today, in a lot of different cases, is the credit card that is used by it's the credit card that is used by consumers to pay. What we where we would like to go is really using a proxy, a number that is not associated to that direct account, so that the consumers feel safe uh, when actually transacting online. It's what we use in a lot of the third-party wallet solutions, Apple Pay, Samsung Pay, um, Google Pay that have launched. It's what we use for Fitbit, Garmin. It's how we right. use the devices themselves. It's how we envision the future going forward. So as merchants are, as retailers are moving into digital, our goal is to truly figure out a way to get some of these card numbers out there to avoid account data compromise, to avoid you know, the risk to the merchant, and also help reduce fraud. So I think we're on time. We are so, on time, yes. So should, should we, do we, we, have like we have time for one question if you'd like to ask one. Sure, sure, in the back. Yeah. We're, we're big proponents of biometrics. So one of the key things that we, um, one of the key roles that we play in MasterCard, and this is, you know, we have an ESS side, and we, I play on the digital side, but we're very much aligned with the ESS side. When you think about um, the way that we push for some of the solutions in, this, in, the security, uh, in the security arena is basically based on global standards. So we abide by the 3DS 2.0 um, secure protocol, um, we, we deploy solutions that are um, PCI Council compliant, you know, like pin on glass or tap on phone. They're new forms of acceptance um, as a way, uh, as, a, as another example on the acceptance side. So I think where we want to go is what I like to call intelligent friction. You know, mm -hmm. the idea that there's so much information that the devices themsel themselves carry. If you follow MasterCard, you know that we're no longer looking at just the purchase information and and trying to, trying to figure out what is the riskiness within a purchase transaction, we're moving towards also partnering um, new data as a company that we just acquired last year, where it's really about behavioral-based um, authentication. So the idea that the way in which consumers are actually um, using their mobile devices, how quickly are they typing, how many errors are they making, um, that also tells us about who the consumer is. So we're combining the purchase information with behavioral based information and now also using other 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 layers like 3, 3ds 2.0 to really do more of a risk based decisioning um, so that we're not necessarily impacting the consumer journey all the time you know we want to minimize right. that as much as possible for that we actually count on additional data sources to help within the within the process excellent so Adam thank you to retail touch points for thank your you, your Andrew, platform Kiki, yeah please join me in thanking yeah. Kiki yeah excellent.